the Duke of Brunswick on his side had broken into Westphalia, where he hoped that the people of his ancient duchy would flock under his banner, but he only succeeded in raising a few villagers. Neglected by Austria, who was sufficiently taken up with her own reverses, forced to flee by the troops which tracked him on every side, the Duke had to gain the seaside with all speed, where together with the rest of his supporters, he was received by the English fleet. These attempts at insurrection necessarily found support in the anti-French spirit of the provinces, whose situation and interests had been changed by our conquests. They were the preludes of a general insurrection in Germany, which was only realized much later, but which the coalition always hoped for. If the ill-arranged enterprises of Dernberg, Schill, and the Duke of Brunswick had taken place simultaneously, the French domination in the north of Germany would have been seriously embarrassed at this time. The French army in Italy commanded by the Viceroy, Eugène, aided and stimulated by the splendid successes of the great army, had taken grand revenge for the reverses which it had experienced at the beginning of the campaign, a reverse which had forced it to retreat as far as the Adige. The Battle of Pavia and several encounters in which the Austrian army, under the command of Archduke John, lost half its force gloriously avenged the army of Italy for the defeat. The Archduke pursued at the point of the sword, got no breathing time, until he had crossed the frontier which separates Upper Italy from the Austrian hereditary states. The Viceroy, Eugène, still on the heels of his adversary, reached Bruck on May 26, where he joined in with the Grand Army. The appearance of the runners of the army of Italy on the simmering was quite an event. The emperor who expected it had sent Laurie Stone, his aide-de-camp, to meet it. And a chasseur of the 9th Regiment of the Army of Italy met with a chasseur of the 20th, sent to reconnoiter by General Laurie Stone. The two soldiers, after having watched each other for some time, saw that each was French and fell into each other's arms. Prince Eugène arrived in Ebersdorf, two days later, where he received the emperor's compliments, which he had so fully deserved. Archduke John had joined the army of the Archduke Palatine, his brother. Prince Eugène marched to meet them and came up with them near Rab, a fortified town in Hungary. On June 14th, he attacked this combined army, which exceeded the French forces by 15,000 men. The enemy was completely routed and lost 6,000 men killed and wounded, cannons and flags. Napoleon expressed his satisfaction to the Viceroy for a victory which, won on June 14th, was honored by him with the name of Granddaughter of the Battle of Marengo, which had been won on the same date on this spot eight years previously. On the 24th, our troops entered the fortified place of Rab, the garrison of which 2,500 men strong became prisoners of war. The island of Lobau had become a large entrenched camp guarded by Marshal Messina's corps, or rather, I should say, a fortified place defended by 120 cannon of big caliber, by mortars and howitzers in batteries. Three large bridges had been built there of a solidity able to resist anything, which were protected by bridgeheads covering a space of more than 1,600 fathoms, composed of palisaded redoubts and surrounded with ditches full of water. During the month which the emperor spent at Schoenbrunn, he had made frequent excursions to Ebersdorf and had occupied himself with his usual activity in the reconstruction of the bridges as well as in giving orders for assembling round Vienna sufficient forces to be ready for an emergency. Napoleon's solicitude, had been applied to the state of the hospitals which he had made his aides-de-camp visit. They had orders to put sums amounting to 60 francs for a soldier and 1,200 francs for an officer on the beds of the wounded soldiers and officers. After the army had rested, the artillery had been reorganized and ammunition of all kinds had been got together. The emperor left Schoenbrunn and transported his headquarters to Ebersdorf on July 4th. The whole army was assembled in the island of Lobau. On the night of the same day, it marched out in perfect order, which was not troubled by a fearful storm accompanied by a deluge of rain, crossing six bridges, 
which had been prepared in advance under the protection of strong stockades, and which had been thrown over the river in a space of two hours with admiral precision. During this time, I was shut up with Monsieur de Champigny, Minister of Exterior Relations, in a room in the Emperor's Lodging at Ebersdorf, where we awaited the result of the crossing of the river with keen anxiety. We listened in mute dismay to the peals of thunder which shook the ground and to the torrents of rain which threatened to drown us all, not knowing whether this riot of elements would favor or impede the armies crossing. We heard at last, towards daybreak, of the entire success of this brave operation. A fine day had followed on this terrible night. The enemy, deceived by false demonstrations on the other side of the river, was astonished to see, deploying in the plain of Enzersdorf, the imposing mass of 150,000 men, backed by 400 pieces of artillery, which had appeared as though by magic, very far from the spot at which they were expected. On the evening of the same day began the attack on an important position, a combat which was the prelude of the great battle of Vagram, which was fought on the morrow, the 6th. I spent this day in the neighborhood of the field of battle, riding about on horseback in company of the colonels Chernichev and Gorgoli, aides-de-camp of the Tsar, who had been sent to the emperor and who found themselves at his headquarters. These two officers were rather dissatisfied at not being called to form a part of the emperor's staff during the action. One of them said with a certain amount of vexation that it was no doubt on account of their white crests that they had been excluded. On the evening of the battle, I joined the emperor's bivouac. Hardly had Napoleon reached it when a cry of Sauve qui peut, say what you can, spread a panic, which fortunately was not of very long duration. A stray band of the enemy had come upon our outpost and had caused this affray. The Battle of Fagram was a murderous one. The Austrians lost 25,000 men and three of their generals were killed. Our losses were less important, but we also lost three generals, including General Lasalle, one of the best general officers in our army. By a sinister presentiment of his approaching end, General Lasalle had the evening before recommended his children to the emperor's care in a touching letter. Napoleon rode over the field of battle to have the wound removed and attended to, which was a duty which he entrusted to nobody but himself. From time to time, he would halt and order silence so that he might hear the groans of the wounded. He would ride in the direction of these groans when he was not detained by having to attend to soldiers on the spot where he happened to be, or else he would send people with help. With this object in view, he used to spread the men of his escort out in different directions. Uday, colonel of the 9th Infantry Regiment, who died in consequence of the wounds which he received in this battle, had been a great deal talked about. Lying rumors collected by the historian of the secret societies of the army and of the military conspiracies have represented this colonel as a leader of these imaginary associations and describe him as having fallen a victim to a murder carried out by Napoleon's orders. The falseness of this calumny has already been easily proved, but it is very absurdity should have sufficed for its refutation. On the morrow of the Battle of Vagram, the emperor, whilst visiting the corps and distributing the rewards which each had merited, met General MacDonald and stretched out his hand to him in sign of reconciliation. MacDonald, a friend of Moreau, had been for a long time in disgrace and kept away from the army. On his asking to be allowed to resume his service, Napoleon, who esteemed his talents, had entrusted him during this campaign with the command of the right wing of the army of Italy under Prince Eugène. He created him Marshal of France as well as Generals Hunot and Marmont. The victory of the French at Wagram had not destroyed the Austrian army, which in spite of the losses which it had experienced, retreated in good order. It was on the 11th August only that Prince John von Liechtenstein presented himself at Zenaim with powers to conclude an armistice and even to treat for peace. The armistice had been proposed by Archduke Charles in virtue of his unlimited powers. The Emperor of Austria, who had retired to Baden, refused to ratify this armistice and removed the Archduke from the command of his army. Napoleon sent him the decoration of a simple Knight of the Legion of Honor. The Emperor Francis, better advised, accepted the armistice five days later with the mental reservation that it would give him the time to reject it during the period fixed for its duration. The Napoleon, after having distributed his troops over the districts designated by the Treaty of the Armistice, proposed by Schoenbrunn, Conferences were open at Altenburg between Monsieur de Champigny and Monsieur de Metternich. 
the negotiations dragging because the Austrian plenipotentiary counting, no doubt, on the diversion which the English expedition in the island of Velkerin would cause, wanted to gain time. The emperor summoned his minister of exterior relations to Vienna after long conversations, to which Napoleon's firmness put a stop. Peace was signed in his presence on October 14th by Monsieur de Champigny and Prince von Liechtenstein, who had taken Metternich's place. It is very probable that the signing of the peace was hurried on by an event which produced a strong impression on Napoleon, though he tried not to let this be seen. One day in October at Schönbrunn, whilst the troops were marching before him at noonday parade, a young man tried to approach the emperor. This person held a paper in his hands, which he thought to be a petition. He was told to hand it to the aide-de-camp in attendance, who was General Rapp. But he answered that he wished to speak to Napoleon. As often rebutted, so often he returned. This matter of insisting appeared suspicious. His decided, though calm, appearance, the expression of his eyes, his right hand, which he held in his bosom, struck General Rapp's attention. The general ordered him to be arrested and had to be taken to the castle. All this was done without being noticed. It was soon known that a large kitchen knife had been found on this young man, who was a student of the University of Erfurt named Stapp. Asked as to what he intended to do with this knife, he had no hesitation declaring that he wanted to kill Napoleon. Informed of this fact, the emperor, on his return to the castle, ordered that the young man should be brought into the drawing room, where the prince of Neuchâtel, Bernadotte, and the generals Duroc and Savary were present. Stop. Approached the emperor with respectful but determined air. He admitted to Napoleon that he had come with the intention of killing him. Although the French sovereign had done him personally no harm, he declared that he had the conviction that in killing the emperor, he should render a great service to his country and to Europe. And asked, added that he was neither ill nor mad, and that he had spoken of his plan to nobody. Napoleon had Dr. Corvisar who was then at Schoenbrunn, sent for and asked him if he could not find any traces of madness in this young man. The doctor felt his pulse and declared that he could not find any symptoms of mental alienation in him. Napoleon, struck by this fanaticism and touched with pity for this precocious murderer, offered to pardon him if he would express his regret for the odious act which he had wished to commit. Stop rejected any idea of pardon and said that he regretted bitterly that he had not been able to carry out his plan. But, said Napoleon, you have a family whose ruin you will cause. You will fill the heart of the young girl who loves you with despair. If I grant you your life, will you be grateful to me for it? I will kill you nonetheless. The emperor gave order that he should be removed, hoping that this young madman would express his repentance and make some revelations. Stops remained three days without eating and as impassive as ever. He walked on foot to the place of the execution, crying, long live Germany, death to the tyrant. Napoleon heard of his execution whilst on his way from Vienna to Munich. By the public and secret clauses of the treaty concluded with Austria, the power ceded territories containing a population of three and a half millions of inhabitants, which for the most part fell to the lot of the kings and princes who were allied to France. Austria undertook by the secret clauses to reduce its army to 150,000 men during the war between France and England to dismiss from the Austrian service all military, civil, and political employees who had been born in French provinces and finally to pay a war indemnity of 85 millions of francs. An article of the treaty added a population of 1,500,000 inhabitants to the Grand Duchy of Warsaw to induce Russia to agree to this fresh step towards the establishment of Poland, a territory of 400,000 inhabitants, which rounded off its frontier on the Ukraine, was ceded to this power, which took part in the treaty. Russia took it over as cheerfully as she had done with the district of Bialystok at Tilsit. When this province was taken from Prussia, her ally, one might have thought that the Russian government sharing the spoils wrested from its allies kept them back to be restored to them when circumstances should allow it. But the events of 1814 and 1815 occurred without Russia's ever dreaming of restoring her acquisitions. The conduct of the Russian government during this campaign seemed to justify the extension which was given to the Grand Duchy of Warsaw. Alexander had undertaken at Warsaw to declare against Austria in case she should again make war in France. Although Napoleon had no reason to expect that the Russian cabinet would make any great efforts to free the provinces, 
which formerly had been Polish, and the successive emancipations of which might appear menacing in the eyes of Russia, which had taken a large part in the division. He was still authorized in considering himself discharged of all obligations towards the Emperor Alexander, who had not kept the promises which he had made at Erfurt. Napoleon, who had counted upon the effective cooperation of Russia, about equal to that which she had formerly tendered to her allies in the wars of the coalition, had just been completely disappointed on this point. The Russian contingent consisted of a body of 15,000 men commanded by Prince Galitsyn, who refused to concert with the French army in any way. The cooperation of this corps consisted in reestablishing Austrian authorities everywhere where they had been replaced by Polish authorities and it's seizing upon Krakow by surprise. The, to establish themselves before the Poles, to whom the Russians refused entrance, on Prince Poniatowski threatening to force his way in, the Russians agreed to occupy the town in common with the Poles. This attitude showed Napoleon how little he could rely on the Russian alliance, but he hid his resentment. What would he have thought if he had known at the time the truth about Prince Schwarzenberg's mission to St. Petersburg? This envoyé, who afterwards became ambassador to Paris in negotiation for Napoleon's marriage with Princess Marie-Louise, and later on commander-in-chief of the United Armies in 1814, had been charged to urge Russia to join Austria in the campaign, which had just finished. Alexander, indeed, had refused these proposals, but not for the motive which he alleged to our ambassador at St. Petersburg. When the Tsar spoke to the latter of his firm resolution to persevere in the Tilsit alliance and to cooperate by his efforts to repel Austria's unjust aggression upon his ally, Emperor Alexander's true motive was to gain time to prepare himself for the struggle which was inevitable in the future, but which at that time he was unable to support against us, owing to the remoteness of his armies occupied the one in Sweden and the other in Turkey. It was this last motive, the only genuine one, which dictated Alexander's replies to the overtures of the Vienna cabinet. This reply was not a defection on Russia's part towards Austria, for its sincerity could be tested in the Russian declarations which were expressed after Napoleon's fall. It could not be doubted that if Russia had really wished to prevent Austria from making war against us in 1809, a simple declaration on her part to the Vienna cabinet would have sufficed. Such was unfortunately the sincerity of Emperor Alexander's sentiments. The Muslim man does not consider himself bound by his promises.